This is our Sunday School lesson from the Faith Pathway publication for December the 11th, 2016. It is from Unit 1, uh, Lesson 2. The Savior has been born, and our title for our lesson is Expect Great Blessings. Our devotional reading is Psalms 111. Our background scripture as well as our printed passage is Luke, the first chapter, verses 39 through 56. And our key verse is the first chapter of Luke, and it is verse 46 through 47. Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Our lesson's aims are explore the ways that Elizabeth and Mary celebrated God's promise of a Savior, feel thankful for the ways that God is at work in the world, and creatively express your confidence in God's promises. Our lesson is a continuation of our lesson from last Sunday, and it actually is rewarding to look at how Mary responds after her faith has been confirmed uh, from the messenger of God. And we see that in uh, Luke, the first chapter, uh, verses 34 going through to 38, we see that the messenger of God, Gabriel, appeared unto Mary and confirmed to her that what she was about to experience was of the Holy Spirit and then also brought her awareness to the fact that her cousin Elizabeth was also conceived and she was going to bring forth a child even in her old age and then the angel spoke unto Mary and let Mary know that nothing, absolutely nothing, is impossible with God. And Mary's response was then, Behold thy maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And that brings us into the beginning of our lesson uh, starting at verse 39. And what we realize is, is that <clears throat> verses 39 through 44 tells us that Mary didn't waste any time. The passage says that Mary hurried to the town on the countryside of Judea. And we find that Mary didn't sit around and wait for another confirmation. Uh, Mary didn't second guess. Uh, Mary didn't hesitate. Uh, Mary didn't allow her mind to drift into idle time because we know that an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And so Mary responded, and right away she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And it tells us that when Elizabeth saw Mary, that the baby leaped in her womb, and immediately Elizabeth felt a overwhelming sensation and realized that she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she acknowledged that she was filled with the Holy Spirit to Mary so Mary could share in the experience and recognize what 
the Holy Spirit and what God was doing in their midst. Although Mary was going to visit her cousin and share the news and and also to uh, uh, participate in the fact that Elizabeth, although she was up in age and barren, that she also was uh, conceived and she was bearing a child. And Mary was going to celebrate this wonderful occasion with her cousin. Now, it was it was not Mary's intention to go and receive this uh, proclamation that she received from Elizabeth. But the scripture clearly tells us that in a loud voice, Elizabeth exclaimed unto Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of the Lord should come to me? And then she explains that upon her arrival, that her child, her unborn child, John, that he leaped in her womb oh, of being excited of the presence of Mary and of the Messiah Christ in her womb. And because it was already ordained that John would be the forerunner preparing the way of the Lord and calling people into repentance, that he would be the announcer of the Lord. John already, the spirit had already conveyed unto the unborn child, that child's purpose. And before the child was born, the purpose for which it was coming into the world had already been fulfilled. And the spirit being pregnant in Elizabeth and also that purpose also being manifested in her womb caused John to leap for joy, recognizing that now I am in the presence of the one that I am called to announce and prepare the way for the people to receive the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now it is worth mentioning that both times when John and Christ meet, they are at the point of a new beginning. Now they meet each other before they know each other in the physical sense. And they are both in their mother's womb. And while they are in their mother's womb, and we know through the birthing process that that baby is capsulized and there is a barrier of water. And they are, we recognize the time of the birth by the breaking of the water. And we find that John and Christ, again, the first time they meet in the physical sense, prior they are in the spiritual sense, but when they meet in the physical sense and then they see each other, it is at the Jordan River where John baptizes our Lord and Savior. And John feels humbled in his spirit and says that actually I should be asking you to baptize me. And yet Christ says to him, yet it behooves us that we fulfill the scripture. And so here we recognize that there is a symbolism connected here of them again 
coming into a newness because now here is Christ receiving the baptism by his cousin John in the uh, Jordan River and now he is set forth on another beginning and he begins his mission work and scripture tells us that to prepare for his work he goes into the wilderness for 40 days to fast and so we recognize here that there is a lot that is attached to this whole order that is being fulfilled through two women who are related and about how God uses the vessel of the woman to bring forth a newness for the whole world. Our lesson goes further and it begins to speak about how the promise was consolidated. Uh, this is carrying through verse 45 through 50. And it lets us know that after Elizabeth has shared with Mary that the baby has leaped in her womb, identifying the Messiah that is in the womb of Mary. It then tells us that blessed is she who has believed the Lord would fulfill his promise in her. Mary fulfilled that and recognized that she was blessed because she hurried. She didn't waste time. She hurried to Elizabeth to celebrate the news that she had received from the messenger of God, Gabriel, the angel. And then it says, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant from now on. All generations will call me blessed. And we get again, we look here at a contrast. We look at the Lord moving among those that for some strange, unfortunate per reason uh, have been relegated to being of low estate, uh, people of low stature, uh, people who are not prominent. And yet, God chooses these vessels to bring forth himself. And so, Mary speaks of how that she is mindful that God is using the humble state of her humbleness, using a normal, a everyday person. Uh, as the vessel to perform his greatest works. And a lot of times, sometimes people who are of low stature, according to some guidelines that we've adopted and accepted in our mind, which says that this means we are successful. This means that you're prominent. This means you are privileged or what have you. And because we've adopted those concepts, a lot of times we don't look at all of God's people in the same light because we have bought in to this system of degrading certain folks and lifting other folks. But scripture tells us that those that humble themselves will be exalted and those that exalt themselves will be humbled. And so we recognize that God recognizes the purity and the genuineness of Mary and her spirit and finds her worthy that this will be the vessel that I will house myself in, in the person of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Mary goes on to tell us, for the mighty one, the self-existing one, our Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the mighty one, 
has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Now, when we hear this word fear, it is not an expression that says that we run and hide because we are afraid or we are fearful because this mighty God is coming to execute wrath upon us. This is not the fear, the way the interpretation of the word fear is used. It is used as reverential trust. So when we read this, it says he has his mercy extends to those who reverentially trust him. And this is not just for a particular time. This is not just for a particular group. This is not just for a particular season. But this here is from generation to generation. This is for all who call out unto God. This is for all who reverentially trust in God. So this is the power and this is the overwhelming experience that Mary is under receiving this information. Now, our lesson concludes and it speaks about the promise comforts that the fulfillment of God's word, that when we see the acts of the Lord being made manifest in us, that this provides comfort for us. Now I want to read these last verses, uh, verse 51 through 56, for it says, this is the NIV. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Again, speaking of those who exalt themselves, who are self-conceited, who are wrapped up in their own self-esteem. Those he has brought down, but he has lifted up those who are humble in spirit. Now, for people in power, this humbleness seems to be a expression of weakness. And many times it is frowned upon because we have again adopted this uh, mindset in this present day culture that it is the survival of the fittest. The strong shall rule the weak. And because we have adopted this, this mindset, many people are uh, hesitant towards being humble and being servant, having a, a servant's heart. Because it's not looked upon as being something that one should be proud of. And so we are running from the things that are actually there to lift us up. And when we look at the attitude of those who are, if we consider them to be prominent, when we look at their demeanor, when we look at their behavior, when we look at their attitude and listen to the things that come from them, are those things, are those things godly? Are those things uplifting? Are those things seeming to be from the heart of one who wants to serve others and one who wants to uplift others? Or are they proud? Are they arrogant? Are they somehow bigoted? When we think about those in power, we should really look at the contrast between what 
is considered to be powerful unto God and what is considered to be powerful in a worldly view, in a manly view. The text goes on and it says, he has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. Another contrast here. It speaks of those that are hungry. Hungry for what? It says that he sent the rich away empty. So if one is hungry and they are hungry for good things, are they longing for and anticipating the same things that the rich have, which caused him to send the rich away? We are so consumed by this material world where all of our wealth and all of our worth is based on tangible things. And those things are temporary. They fade. They collect dust. They rot. They rust. Those things are temporary. And yet we give them so much credence. And we use those things to evaluate ourselves on things outside of the temple of God. Where God looks in the heart, we're looking on the outside. And the scripture is constantly telling us about the spirit and the spirit overwhelmed Mary. The spirit overwhelmed Elizabeth. And we keep focusing on the humanness of ourselves. Things that we can touch. Things that we can see. Things that we can spend. Things that we can accumulate more stuff with. These are not the good things that the scripture says he was given to those that were hungry. How about those that are hungry for a change in their spirit, a change in their mental state, a change in their mind, a change in the way they interact with one another, a change in the process of how they are willing to go out and work for the Lord and help build this kingdom. So sometimes our focus is in the wrong place. And as a result, we see the type of foolishness that we have in the world today. Let's go ahead. And it says he has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. So Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. We would like to close uh, on the end of the text, speaking of the promise. And we're talking about that the promise comforts, uh, the promise relieves uh, tension, uncertainty, uneasiness. And so it says that the promise was made to Abraham and his descendants forever and to our ancestors. And I want to read a familiar passage, uh, which is quite often cited during this time of the year, uh, because this unveils the promise that God made uh, to our foreparents and then the fulfillment of prophecy and scripture. It is out of, of course, Isaiah, the ninth verse, and it begins at the sixth verse. I'm sorry, Isaiah, the ninth chapter, the ninth chapter, and it begins at the sixth verse. And it reads, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. The government of the world will be a weight upon our Lord. But, but do not be dismayed. 
Don't be troubled in spirit, for let us read further to receive the comfort of this promise. We, even though corrupt governments rise and fall, and although it identifies that the government would be a weight upon its shoulder, it says, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. These would be the characteristics. These would be the acknowledgments of the spirit of the child that would be born unto us. And it goes on to say, although the government would be a weight upon him, it says of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. We see kingdoms and rulers and nations rise and fall. But the scripture tells us that of the holy child, of his government and his increase, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and and justice, not privilege, not favor, but with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal, the excitement, the anticipation of the Lord of hosts will perform this. We are closing our lesson for Sunday, December, December the 11th, which titles for us expect great blessings. And we certainly hope and pray that something that we have said will be of comfort to you in these days and in these times. And in most importantly, we ask that Almighty God will continue to unfold and reveal unto us the things he would have us to know and understand, and that he will compel us by his spirit to not just be hearers of his word, but to be doers as well. God blessing upon you and yours is always our prayer.